a History Channel. March along with the greatest killing machine the world had ever seen. Conquerors who turned the ancient world into an empire. Men so fierce, they were feared by their own emperors. For nearly a thousand years, the world quaked to their footsteps and to the very sound of their name. The Roman legions, the elite troops of Rome's all-powerful army, would conquer an empire that stretched from the highlands of Scotland to the sands of Arabia. But Rome's domination of the ancient world would come only after a long and bloody journey, because mighty Rome and its legions had the humblest of beginnings. When Rome was born around 700 BC, on the spot where its legendary founders Romulus and Remus were raised by a she-wolf, it was nothing more than a collection of farmers' huts located on Rome's Palatine Hill. Rome's grandeur and the might of its legions was still far in the future. Rome's army was composed of local civilians, hurriedly called together for skirmishes with neighboring villages. A trumpet would sound, and Roman men would gather to be ranked according to wealth. Only men of property were allowed to fight because they could be trusted to defend the city. Fighting for Rome was considered an honor, and everyone provided his own equipment. The wealthy, who could afford swords and shields, were the officers. Poorer Romans, who could only afford slingshots, became the foot soldiers. This civilian army was given the Latin name for call-up, legio, or legion. The legions had some early success against their neighbors, but in 390 BC, Roman confidence was shattered in a way that would change their history and the world's forever. Roaming warriors from France, the Gauls, swept down through Italy, overrunning the legions on the edge of Rome. For six months, the Gauls burned and looted Rome before moving on, leaving the Romans with stark evidence of their army's inferiority. Rome now knew that survival would depend on having a disciplined, professional military machine, and they would spend the next few centuries perfecting just that. What would enable Rome to build the world's greatest army? At the heart of their rise to the top was a deep belief in their own destiny. Remember, Roman, it is for you to rule nations, to tame the proud by war. Virgil, Roman poet. A Roman noble saw himself was in competition not only with the others in his cohort, but with his ancestors. The Roman word was emulatio, emulation. And that's where they really got that tremendous drive, that tremendous pride, the need not to let the family down, which drove many of these men. The Roman army's determination to become invincible could be seen in their training. There were endless drills and marches to the point of exhaustion. No one had ever trained with such machine-like discipline. They train with the intensity of war. That is why the shock of war affects them little. Josephus, ancient historian. Discipline became a cult, literally worshipped by the legions. Soldiers who broke it could pay with their lives. Legionnaires could be stoned to death by their own unit for cowardice in battle or even for falling asleep on sentry duty. From Roman military life came the word decimation, the practice of killing every tenth man in a unit that had mutinied or deserted. The guilty men would draw lots, and one in ten would then be clubbed to death by his comrades. It is horrible, but I think it makes perfect sense within 
the climate of the time. The only way in the final instance to set a standard of fear in a rough military group of men was by some very harsh punishment. Minor offenses drew a sudden thrashing from the feared career officers, the Centurions, who carried vine branches for the task. But on the battlefield, it was the harsh discipline that gave the legions the edge over their enemies. Their opponents often fought in loose arrangements, seeking individual glory. But every one of the 5,000 soldiers in a Roman legion had a precise role to play in a master strategy. An assault would begin at long range, using catapults which showered the foe with boulders and iron bolts. Next, the legion would launch its javelins, causing terrible injuries as they rained down on the enemy. Then the legionnaires would stand shoulder to shoulder, tapping their swords against their shields in a reverberating beat of impending doom. Finally, they'd begin their advance, a moving wall of destruction. When they closed with the enemy, the Romans then drew the gladius, the short stabbing sword, but their shield extended from their chin to their ankles. They then advanced and very few enemies could stand up to this wall of shields with the, with the gladii poking out in front. Rome's enemies often used long, slashing swords that looked impressive, but were ineffective in close fighting. The Romans used their shields and their short stabbing swords to do the maximum possible damage. I can bump them a bit with the shield, knock them slightly off balance, and while the, while the enemy was trying to, to make out, wonder what to do next, uh, out the sword would come out from beside the, the shield and you would get them suddenly under the, under the ribs, in and up. Using these techniques, Rome began to conquer the Italian peninsula. Tens of thousands of fellow Italians were massacred and slain or forced to fight for Rome. But where would Rome's thirst for glory end? And could Rome's legions protect it against its growing enemies? By around 300 BC, the legions were making Rome the master of Italy. But how would the legions fare against the inevitable challenge from foreign powers? When that challenge came, it would leave the world no doubt about the skill and the ruthlessness of Rome's military machine. In 264 BC, a dispute over territory sparked a brutal war with another expanding city on the Mediterranean, Carthage, in northern Africa. Carthage was a sea power, while Rome was not. But Rome countered that advantage with a stunning combination of determination and self-confidence. The Romans quickly began building ships, using a design stolen from the Carthaginians. But the legions faced another problem. Roman soldiers had no experience with sailing strategy. Unfazed, they overcame the problem through a leap of imagination. On dry land, they pretended to row in unison to develop their oarsmanship. Once the boats were built, they did some real sailing near the coast and pronounced themselves ready for war. They think that nothing is impossible if they have decided on it. Polybius, Greek historian. But how could a landlubber navy hope to battle Carthage, the master sailors? Again, the Romans showed their inventiveness by turning sea battles into land battles. They invented the boarding bridge, a type of gangplank that let them invade enemy ships seems bizarre, seems simplistic, but it worked. What they did was to try to make naval fighting infantry fighting. In other words, you put your foot soldiers on a boat, 
You tried to get close to the enemy, to grapple them close, to put a bridge over. Then they went over and they fought with them like they were fighting on land. Stunned by the strategy, the Carthaginian fleet was routed. But victory at sea was not enough. Over the next hundred years, Rome and Carthage would fight grueling land battles all around the Mediterranean coast. The most spectacular threat to Rome came from Carthage's great general Hannibal, who led his army and elephants from Africa through Spain and across the Alps into Italy. Hannibal inflicted some crushing defeats on the Roman legions, and he laid siege to Rome itself. Rome might have fallen if legions advancing on Carthage had not forced Hannibal to return home to defend his own capital. Among the many casualties of the war was the Greek mathematician Archimedes. He designed catapults for Carthage, and he was working on new geometric figures when a Roman legionnaire discovered him and stabbed him to death. For Carthage, dreams of empire were about to end. Finally, after a century of exhausting battles, the Roman legions marched on Carthage in 149 BC. They burned the city, plowed it into the ground, and sowed it with salt, symbolically dooming their enemy for all eternity. There is a sort of a bloodlust that develops. Uh, the more the Romans get in touch with people they don't understand culturally, the more they seem to have a great deal of bloodthirst. Rome emerged as the ruthless new leader of the Mediterranean. But controlling its newly won territories was a burden. Rome had 130,000 soldiers in uniform. One Roman man in eight was in the army. For Romans with property, being in the legions was becoming too much of a full-time job. So the ranks were thrown open to all citizens, and Rome expanded even further. From its conquered lands, Rome recruited units with special skills, like archery and cavalry, to fight alongside the legions. The Syrian archers were famous. We are told that they uh, learnt to ride and to shoot as children. The Romans were never any good at, at archery. This isn't a Roman skill. So they're bringing in these skilled archers. The foreign recruits were called auxiliaries, and if they served 25 years, they were rewarded with Roman citizenship. But was there a hidden danger for Rome in expanding its army this way? The result was that many soldiers now had less interest in defending Rome than in making their fortune through the spoils of war. Their loyalty was no longer to Rome, but to their generals. They understood who gave them the food and the money and the chance for sacking, pillaging, so that uh, their idea of Rome gets very diluted in the outskirts. And people serving, say, in the Middle East are Rome schmom. I mean, it's not what is Rome. Uh, it's, they didn't have the same ideals. The ambition of one general in particular made him a hero to his troops, Julius Caesar. Caesar recruited and paid his own legions and trained them to give unquestioned devotion. On one occasion, when supplies ran low, they even followed orders to eat grass. They conquered most of France, leaving a million dead and wounded in their wake. So loyal were Caesar's legions that they had no hesitation in killing their own countrymen for him. In 49 BC, Caesar and his 12 legions returned to Italy to fight a civil war against Rome's official army in a battle for absolute power. The world's greatest army had turned against itself. Legion was now fighting legion. 
find a case where uh, a father finds himself fighting his son. Father is, a, is a, as an old soldier in the Legion, and his son has been newly recruited in a Legion which finds itself on the other side, and they meet in battle, but they meet in battle without knowing who they are, uh, and the, the, the son kills the father, and only uh, after, uh, after he's been killed and he's examining the body, uh, he discovers who it is. Caesar's legions, so battle-hardened and loyal, won easily. Caesar then became dictator for life, but his assassination soon after led to more civil war. The legions would not be brought together again until Augustus emerged as the first emperor and restored unity. Augustus made the soldiers swear allegiance to the emperor, not to ambitious generals. He also paid them directly from Rome in coins that reminded them exactly who the emperor was. And it really made them very, very loyal, very, very committed, very, very focused. There were rewards for loyalty. There were rewards for competence. There was continuity. And I think that when they were fighting far less organized opponents, that was an enormous advantage. With newly focused determination, the legions rapidly expanded the empire in the first century AD, penetrating as far as Britain. Local tribes in their hill forts tried resisting, but were massacred by the relentless Roman machine. Was there a fortress anywhere that could resist the power of the Roman legions? Near the Dead Sea, high above the deserts of what is now Israel, stands a stronghold that 2,000 years ago must have seemed impregnable to any human force, even the Roman legions. The fortress Masada was part of Judea, which the Romans had conquered around the time of Jesus' birth. The Roman occupation was bitterly resented by the natives of Judea, the Jews. There is a feeling that what the Romans are trying to do is to try to undermine Jewish belief. And of course, the Jews had always had, their whole history uh, is one of what's necessary for survival. And what's necessary for survival is maintenance of your language and your belief system. In the year 66, the Jews revolted in open warfare and Jewish rebels battled the legions across the Holy Lands. In retaliation, the Romans destroyed most of the capital of Jerusalem, including the Great Temple. The legions carried off Jewish holy relics and paraded them through Rome in triumph. But Jewish resistance was not finished. Bands of zealots began occupying ancient fortresses in the desert, intent on continuing the struggle. The greatest of these fortresses, Masada, was on a plateau 1,300 feet high. It had been built a hundred years earlier by King Herod as a safe haven against attack by the Egyptian army, and it seemed unassailable. 960 Jewish zealots were using it as a base for pillaging the surrounding countryside. Secure in their fortress, they dared the Romans to try to take them. There was no prospect of starving the place out anytime soon because Herod and his uh, successors had put huge stores of food. Uh, there was plenty of water because Herod had constructed huge uh, rain-fed cisterns inside the mountain that were, that were fed during the winter rains. Um, the only way to take Masada was by direct assault. The apparently impossible task of assaulting the plateau fortress fell to a single legion, the 10th. Backed by a thousand auxiliary troops and Jewish prisoners captured in the war, the legion was 15,000 men strong when it arrived at the foot of Masada in the autumn of 72 AD. The full force of Roman might 
was about to launch itself against a rebel outpost, even though the legions had already taken Jerusalem. It was symbolic more than anything. Plutarch once said that if you get in trouble with the Romans, they put their boot on your neck. And I think the Romans were putting their boots now onto the uh, Jewish neck. Unlike the rebels above, who were well supplied, the legion was camped in a merciless desert, scorching by day and freezing at night. All food and building materials for a siege would have to be trekked in from great distances. Another army might have moved on, but not the legions powered by Roman pride. They could take almost any seemingly impregnable fortress through the uh, use of uh, siege engines and uh, their own courage. And with this army, Rome conquered the entire Mediterranean world, the only time that the Mediterranean world has ever been under the rule of a single, a single government. The 10th Legion began by encircling the entire plateau with a stone wall six feet high and nearly three miles long a message to the rebels that they were cut off forever. But how could the Romans even hope to assault the summit? From nearly every angle, the cliffs were just too steep. But there was one possibility, an outcrop on the western side. Here, the legion would try building a ramp to the top in order to bring its heavy weapons within range of the rebels. You can imagine, of course, how every soldier is a engineer, is a uh, shovel person, is carrying pails of dirt and rocks and things, as well as carrying their weapons. The Romans and their Jewish prisoners began building the ramp as the rebels showered them with rocks and any other missiles they could find. But the Romans pressed on and after six months came within 50 yards of the summit. From there, the catapults forced the rebels back while the Romans battered an opening through the outside walls. They breached the outer wall, but found the rebels had retreated behind a second wall made of earth and timber, which their battering rams could not budge. So the Romans set this wall on fire and waited for the next morning to make their final assault. But inside, the rebels were not prepared to wait for the inevitable. They knew the fate awaiting them after capture by the legions, slavery, rape, and ritual murder. The zealots leader, Eliezer ben Yair, told them God had decided their fate and that it was better to die honorably now than to wait for the Romans in the morning. Come, while our hands are free and can hold a sword, let them do noble service. Let us die unenslaved by our enemies and leave this world as free men. Eleazar ben Yair. When the Romans burst into the fortress the next morning, they found no enemy to meet them. Shouts to surrender brought nothing but echoes. Finally, two women and five children emerged from hiding to announce themselves as the only survivors. The Jewish rebels had killed all the other women and children and then themselves in a final act of defiance. And it was a heroic defense by the defenders, but from the perspective of a Roman historian, what's really astounding about this whole operation is that the Romans took this seemingly impregnable fortress while suffering almost no casualties in doing so. Nothing demonstrates the power of the Romans' brilliance and siegecraft more than the siege of uh, Masada. A military force that could take Masada must have felt invincible. But was there a way to defeat the legions? 
Deep in a German forest, an enemy would prove that there was, to the Legion's horrible cost. The Roman legions had registered one crushing victory after another throughout the ancient world. But were they invincible? In this German forest in the year 9 AD, they would have their answer. Germany had long been a prize target for the Romans, and under the Emperor Augustus, the legions had subdued the local tribes, or so they thought. Rome was so confident of its hold on Germany that Augustus appointed his great nephew as military commander there. Quintilius Verus was a lawyer by trade with little knowledge of war. And his appointment to Germany can, I think, be interpreted as a sign that Augustus and his advisors thought that Germany was now largely pacified and ready for regular civilian administration. Why were the Romans so complacent? One reason was that many German soldiers had fought with the legions in their European campaigns. One of them, Arminius, had fought so well that the Romans had made him a knight of the empire. Even though he left the army to return to Germany, the Romans still counted him as an ally. But that trust would prove fatal. Arminius told the Roman commander Verus of an uprising in northern Germany and advised him to take three legions there to deal with it. Verus was warned that Arminius was leading him on. I mean, he was, you know, there were Germans who were prepared to come to Varus and say, don't trust him. And Varus, according to this account, wouldn't listen to them. When Varus headed north in his trust and ignorance, he was walking into a full-scale rebellion, a rebellion planned by Arminius himself. As a former Roman officer, Arminius knew exactly how to set the trap. And because Arminius, who was even a Roman citizen, had been schooled in the Roman army before he turned traitor to Rome and returned to his own country, uh, he knew Roman military tactics, he knew Roman military operations, he knew well the forces that he was going to ambush in the forest. Varus had taken with him three legions and auxiliaries, about 20,000 soldiers in all, plus 10,000 civilians, the regular camp followers. The Romans were traveling as if in time of peace. They had women and even children with them in the column, following in the, in the baggage train. So really, they were, they'd set themselves up for uh, a battle that they really couldn't win. Varus was so unsuspecting that he took a shortcut through a narrow gap between a forest and a swamp, just as Arminius had hoped. It began to rain, and they were making their way between the mountain on one side and the marsh to the other side. And then came the initial German attack, which was launched by spears. Uh, from some distance at first, which killed quite a few of the Romans and put them into confusion. Arminius had caught the legions at their most vulnerable. On open fields, Roman discipline was almost unbeatable. But in the depths of the German forest, the legions had no answer to the guerrilla tactics of their opponents. Imagine the scene in this forest 2,000 years ago with the Romans trapped here in the pouring rain, the pandemonium, the wagons overturning, the cavalry horses stampeding, the Roman women and children crying and shrieking as they died. The fighting lasted three days and ended in a complete disaster for the Romans. Three entire legions and their followers, some 30,000 people, were slaughtered. Only a few hundred escaped. 
Varus himself committed suicide along with his top officers rather than fall into the German hands, and probably with good reason, because the Germans, in fact, treated the captured Romans in a very barbaric fashion, burned them alive, and so forth. The news caused panic and disbelief in Rome. Overnight, the empire had lost three of its 28 legions, more than 10% of its army. For years afterwards, Augustus roamed the palace screaming, Quintilius Verus, give me back my legions. But perhaps the blame lay less with field commander Verus and more with the judgments made in Rome itself. After the disaster, after his death, he was the scapegoat, he was the fall guy. The blame for the disaster is not only his, but Augustus's, Augustus and his advisors back in Rome. Also at fault were the legions themselves and a state of mind that allowed them to fall into the fatal trap. Laziness, the Romans made the one error they taught never to make. They got relaxed. They were not highly energized and so they were caught uh, by the Germans who knew how to have fight in this type of territory very well. Rome would never conquer Germany, but it would send soldiers to the same German forest a few years later to discover the fate of the lost legions. They came across uh, an awful scene of unburied jumbles of bones lying around and skulls pounded into tree trunks and uh, military equipment scattered everywhere and so forth. And they tried to gather up the bones and give these Roman comrades a decent burial. Ever since, the exact site of the disaster had been lost to history. Arminius had become a great German folk hero, but there was no record of just where in the forest he'd won his historic victory. That changed in 1987, when an archaeologist, using a metal detector like this one, found dozens of buried Roman coins here. Was this the definitive clue to the site? None of the coins were dated later than 9 AD, meaning they were almost certainly carried by Verus's legions. Further digging has unearthed equipment such as a Roman doctor's medical instruments that would have gone unused here, and the metal mask of a Roman cavalry officer, a silent witness to the horror of an ancient slaughter. The tragedy in the forest was an enormous blow to the Roman legions, but they would recover and go on to new conquests that would literally reshape the world as they went. How could an army capable of savage destruction also be creators of beauty, of cities, roads, and monuments? Through six centuries of brutal conquests, the Roman legions built an empire that stretched from Britain across the length of Europe to the deserts of the Middle East. Once conquered, the colonies were controlled through fear. To resist the legions was to invite terrible punishment. And it was not just the conquered who feared them. The fear extended to the emperors themselves. No emperor ruled without the legions' support, and not one survived their displeasure. Most powerful of all was the Praetorian Guard, stationed in Rome itself. It had the power of life and death over the emperors. On a single day in 41 AD, the guard murdered the emperor Caligula and then replaced him with his uncle Claudius, whom they found cowering in fear behind a palace curtain. They could kill whoever was there that wasn't paying them or wasn't taking good care of them or they felt was acting contrary to the their interests, which were not really always the interests of Rome, but the interests of their leaders.
So great was the army's power to make or break emperors that in the year 193, the Praetorian Guard put the crown up for auction. Two wealthy Romans began bidding for it, and the soldiers spurred them on to raise their bids. Finally, Dedius Julianus was declared the winner when he promised each guard a bribe of five years' pay. But Julianus overpaid. Just 66 days later, he was killed by a soldier inside the palace, and the legions in the field installed one of their generals, Septimus Severus, as emperor. He was one of 10 legion commanders who would become emperor. The basic problem of the Roman state is that there is no constitution. There is no easy system of succession within a constitutional form. Once three or four or five generals realize that whichever one gets to Rome will become emperor, the temptation is too hard to avoid. Not surprisingly, Emperors did their best to keep the legions busy in the field so that they didn't have time to hatch plots. When they weren't fighting battles, the legions were usually building great public works. Partly to keep everybody busy, but partly because if you were an ally of Rome, the Romans would uh, show you that they were your good friends and help build civic buildings. Each legion included architects, engineers, surveyors, and craftsmen. And with legionnaires providing the labor, they rebuilt the world. For themselves, the legions built complex forts, complete with bathhouses and sometimes amphitheaters where they would hold Roman games, perhaps even sacrificing prisoners captured in war. With their public works, they imitated Rome itself, building aqueducts, baths, canals, and above all, roads. The legions covered the empire in roads to allow the fast movement of troops and trade. Many have been turned into Europe's highways, and many others are still in use. On the frontiers of Europe, the legions were the torchbearers of civilization. In many places, Roman technology had never been seen before. Many European cities, including Bath, London, Barcelona, and Bonn, were begun as Roman settlements. Gradually, as they became the preeminent civilization in the Mediterranean world, they saw themselves as the civilized, as against these barbarians. Why did the legions spend so much effort in building up their colonies? It was a way of keeping the provinces under control. Local leaders soon became aristocrats, fond of their Roman comforts. Savage people were drawn towards baths and elegant banquets, but these were the chains of enslavement. Tacitus, Roman historian. But Roman rule could not last forever. By the year 400, the iron grip of the Roman legions was weakening. What caused the greatest army the world had ever seen to be toppled from power? One reason was its increasing reliance on foreign soldiers. Now only one soldier in a hundred was Italian, compared with 65% in Augustus's day. I think that the Romans lost a lot of their initial energy because they were, now uh, their ranks were being occupied by people who had other interests, uh, other religions, uh, other enthusiasms. With less national pride, the legion's famous discipline began to fade. Once their strict rules had banned the soldiers from marrying, now, legionnaires were raising families inside the forts. From inside the barrack buildings, um, there are uh, quite clearly not merely soldiers' shoes, but children's shoes. 
And it looks as if soldiers had their families actually in the barracks with them. The Roman tactic of fighting in tight formations required the strictest discipline. Without it, the strategy could not succeed. The legions became easy targets for the fiercely determined barbarians invading Italy, like the Vandals and the Huns. Attila the Hun mocked the once formidable legions as cowards hiding behind their shields. Legions were recalled from the frontiers to defend Italy, but the barbarian raids proved irresistible. The notion that the Romans could stand there with their finger in the dike along the Rhine River forever, I think, is folly. It is not simply a matter of being tough enough. The pressures are beyond that. Rome and the western half of its empire fell to the barbarians in 476 AD. The legions melted back into the general population. The glory days of their infantry warfare were gone, overwhelmed by the cavalry charges that had brought the barbarians victory. But no defeat on the battlefield could erase the mark of the legions. Unlike any force before or since, they dominated the Mediterranean and beyond, leaving a legacy of roads, laws, language, and architecture that we still encounter on every step of our journey in search of history.